I look deliriously happy. I am, because I'm sitting next to my most favourite lady in the whole wide world, and her name is Björk. Welcome to Hamburg. Thank you. It's lovely to see you again. Oh, great to see you. And how, how are you? 2002, tours done mostly, album's been out for a while. Mm -hmm. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Yeah. Just, uh, just starting to write my next one. Now, I'm not a journalist, you know that. But listen, I'm just a fan. And listening to Vespertine, it seemed to me that it was possibly your least immediate album, and yet it's become your fastest selling album, isn't it? How, how do you come to terms with that or explain it? I don't know. I, I guess it's been this peculiar thing ever since um, I left the Sugar Cubes and I played my songs for uh, the record company. And he said, this is very strange. This will sell the third of the sugar cubes. And I said, well, that, fair enough. I still have to do it, you know. And, and uh, it seems the more um, idiosyncratic or selfish I get, the more people like it or something. Mm. I don't know. Maybe there's not even a formula there. Right. But, um, but uh, I, I guess I just have my own mission and I have to follow it. And if people uh, are still curious and interested, that um, makes me very happy, you know? But well, you said the Vespertine was really made, unless I'd misunderstood, that it was made for you to listen to at home, because it is an album about home and the inner self, and read a good book while you're listening to the album. But then I thought, 
I tried it, and yeah. it works really well. Yeah. But then doesn't Bjork become background music? Um, people like Eric Satie or Claude Debussy um, did music, and they aimed to do music that was called, in French, uh, furniture music. Mm -hmm. But um, probably doesn't translate very well. The music de meuble. <laughs> I'm not oh. sure. <laughs> French is not my strong point. But it's sort of, they wanted the music to be um, like part of the room, part of the room that you're in, that you're not, it's not narrative. It's not like a person that's speaking to you. It's someone who's just there and makes you feel good, you know? And then maybe later in the century, you had someone like Brian Eno who did, then the music got a, probably a, a title that's more known, which is called ambient mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. which is an, an um, and I, I guess it's, it's still a debate. Do you want music to be uh, very narrative and very like, hello, listen to me with headphones, notice me? Or if you want it to be just kind of like around you, like a beautiful room that makes you do the things you want to do, you know? And uh, is, is the music the main role or are you the main role? That's, that's sort of the question in a way. And I think, I think for me personally, uh, both have a right to exist. And yet, in, in the media, when we see you most of the time, you don't like to talk about that's personal stuff that I do at home, it's my own personal stuff, which is fair enough, I think we all have that. But on the album, there is a lot of personal stuff. Did the people that you were writing about know that? Did they see themselves in the album? Did they talk to you about it? Yeah, I, the people I, I wrote about, um, I, I would play the songs for them. And, and they are the only ones who know. A person like me that wants, uh, from, since I'm a child, I want to, I have this craving to make music. And, and people who are like that, they, it's also a craving to be generous, you know. And then uh, you suddenly probably become famous. And then you're generous to the point that you're giving like absolutely everything away from you. And, and then I guess you sort of sit back and you think, wait a minute, uh, uh, why have I become stingy? But the real uh, gift I can give as a musician is, uh, is sort of an emotional, uh, very, very intimate thing.
Talk a little bit about Iceland because obviously that's very, very important to you. Do you think going back though? Do you think that that has very been very important in your makeup, in your musical makeup, to not be, for example, in England or in America or even Germany, bombarded all the time by pop music? I mean, did you grow up with a lot of that modern music, or was there a lot of like Iceland music around? I think uh, my household it was probably quite unusual for Iceland because there was always a record on the gramophone. It was, it was, um... How many people in the house? It was like seven people in the house, grown-ups, and I was like the only kid. And, um, th there would be, like, I remember, like, a cue by the record player. Like, there would be always a record on. And, the, and so, I, I heard a lot, a lot of music as in my childhood. I think probably what's unusual about Iceland is we have this kind of identity that we are far from the rest of the world, which we are. <laughs> and we are watching it like from some sort of a, a balcony. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> and we just sort of don't like most of it and then we sort of pick what we like, you know. And so we don't get attached if it's like a form of a movement or if it's like a political thing or, or a, we, for example, in the punk period, we had no Margaret Thatcher to hate, you know. Iceland has always been like that for a thousand years. Now, the first most of us probably heard about Iceland, apart from at school, was obviously the sugar cubes, because you had massive success in England and in America, it all happened very quickly. Do you think that then helped create a, a music scene that people in Iceland would say, hey, we can get guitars and go and be, have, sell records in America? Do you think that helped? I think there are sort of bands that have uh, gotten uh, attention abroad that are from Iceland like Sugar Cubes and me and Sigurós. Um, it has definitely helped that none of us um, were aiming to please or, or um, like because there was a lot, a lot of bands I remember when I was a teenager that were sort of trying to be the Icelandic U2 or the Icelandic this or that and, 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 and copying basically what was going on abroad. And then they go abroad and figure out that the abroad didn't want more abroad. They wanted, you know, they had enough yeah, yeah. <laughs> for themselves. So the fact that, that, that um, I, th I, I can see now, I mean, I hope it's not, I'm not being too big-headed saying that, but I can see 
in Iceland that, that has had a big effect. The people, like young kids there now that are doing music, they're not trying to imitate this and that. They're, 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 um, it's, it's all about having your own voice and, 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 and being original. Okay, well, this might be a good point to no. have a look at Iceland and have a look at some of your career so far, okay? Yeah, yeah. Björk in Iceland and on video. Iceland, terre des mythologies, île des elfes et des trolls, où les prodiges de la nature se vivent au quotidien. Mais l'Islande s'est également découvert un prodige vocal, Björk, la sirène qui vient du froid. Björk, la magicienne, maîtresse de la métamorphose. Depuis 1993, elle change d'orientation musicale et de look à chaque album. Mais sa voix reste la même, unique, comme une immuable signature. J'imagine que je suis un peu inallumée parce que j'ai tout le temps envie de chanter. C'est ce que je préfère. Quand je fais autre chose, je me sens comme un poisson hors de l'eau. Quand je commence à chanter, je me sens chez moi. Chez elle, c'est-à-dire à Reykjavik. C'est là que Björk Gudmundsdottir est née en 1965. À 5 ans à peine, elle fréquente l'école de musique. À 11, elle sort son premier album, itinéraire d'une enfant déjà starifiée. En 1987, avec des amis punk, Björk crée les Sugar Cubes. La pop rock islandaise fait son entrée dans les charts internationaux. Il faut que les gens soient convaincus que la magie les entoure. Elle n'existe pas que pour les stars d'Hollywood ou pour quelques privilégiés. Tout le monde peut faire de la magie, même dans leur cuisine. Quand la musique devient une échappatoire, même les usines se transforment en univers de rêve. Dans le film Dancer in the Dark de Lars von Trier, Björk incarne une jeune femme qui découvre la musique des choses. Une performance d'actrice que le festival de Cannes couronnera d'une palme d'or. Musicalement, Björk situe la composition et les bruitages sur le même plan. Je rêve de rapprocher ces deux univers. J'ai toujours voulu être un trait d'union entre ces deux mondes. Björk vit dans un monde de techno et de dance, deux éléments qu'elle incorpore à sa musique, aussi spontanément qu'elle y intègre les chœurs des Inuits qui l'ont accompagnée au cours de sa dernière tournée. Björk s'est approprié le secret des elfes. Elle dévoile sa vie intérieure tout en conservant sa propre part de mystère. Rien n'illustre mieux ce paradoxe que Vespertine, son dernier album. It's it's uh, it's not in nature's nature to stay the same. For example, your hair, you know, you have to. Don't talk about my hair. You, <laughs> oh, you have to you have to cut it. <laughs> no, it grows. It's, it's with normal people. They have hair and then it grows and then it grows and then they cut it or whatever. Yeah. But with people who are in my job, they have hair and then it grows and they've changed their image, you know. Yeah, yeah. And they reinvented themselves. Yeah, I know, <laughs> So I, I think everybody change. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a feel good factor. I think probably more than courage. Is that, are those your decisions? What you wear and how you show yourself? Do you have people advising you and do you choose things, or is it you or someone else? Well, I I, uh, I decide what I wear. Yeah, but I'm, I I have a lot of friends who are really um, uh, obsessed <laughs> <laughs> with clothes. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by good people. <laughs> There's something you take very seriously is the staging uh, of your concerts. How do you come about that? What happens then in your head? How, you have to make the music go to pictures then, I guess. I think with this tour, I wanted the music to play the main role. You know, there was a, a, a moment, I think we all thought, wait a minute, we're in opera houses. These are the sort of stages you can bring in elephants and volcanoes. Why don't, why don't you sit? 
that's yeah. going to be the only tour you do in opera house is go for it, you know. And then, which just looked very exciting and tempting for a little bit, and then, because compared to Homogenic, the tour I did before, I wanted all the importance to go on the music. Mm. And that music was the chocolate, and, and you lie in your comfortable chair, and and with, with the orchestra and the, and, and the choir and everything, and almost make a statement that you don't need more. You don't need, like, you know, incredible, you know, special effects and editing and, and elephants and whatever. Music is enough. Your voice, right? For me, and I'm sure for lots of other people, it's the only voice that I've ever heard that can bring me to tears. Some of your, the things you reach, and to, not with words, with sounds. When do you discover that you couldn't just go, human nature, you know, you, you went way out there. How young were you when that happened? I don't know. I guess as a child I sang a lot. You know, I, I was, my mom would take me to uh, the bus in the morning and I would actually be a Julie Andrews. I would, I would actually stand up and walk back and f down the bus and want to sing and make everybody happy, you know, and, and which is a bit sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. Yeah, so so I think from very early on, I, I definitely and and uh, and I've heard. I think a lot of singers have that. You know, they they kind of uh, like when I was in. I remember going on school trips, and the other kids would ask me if it was a long drive back or something. They would ask me to sing. I mean, you've been composing since the age of eleven. Do, is it still done in Iceland in your little mountain hut and wandering around, or do you write on the tour bus and in airports and where where do you write? I think uh, part of me is always like a, like a machine that uh, never stops. I mean, I, I always uh, have I had a song in the back of my head. And, and uh, like when I wake up, there's a song there or whatever. Um, uh, I think most of my melodies, though, I, I think like 90% of them, probably more, are all, uh, are all written in nature. And as long as I'm in a place where I can sing at the top of my lungs and no one hears me.
you collaborate with a lot of people. How is it? I mean, I know that you create the basics, the foundations, and then you give it to people. That's almost like giving your baby to someone and saying, now, don't give them that to eat and don't do that. How do you let it go? Most of it is very intuitive, you know, and, and, and some songs I can complete on my own and, and other songs just need that little extra something. Or, um, and then there are also songs that are written uh, with, with a person where we walked into a room and started together from scratch, you know, they're completely 50-50. It's sort of about, most cases, I know the person I pass it on to very, very well. Mm, okay. um, or I know it's music really, really well that I've been playing it in my house for a few years, so it sort of feels like it's part of me. So I kind of know. Is that what happened with those great guys from San Francisco? Yeah. Matmos, is that what happened with them? You knew them already? You listened to them? Yep, yeah, I probably mostly have been listening a lot to them, but they also had done some remixes for me. So I already could sort of see what sort of they do and how, you know. So, um, and then of course they added a lot of stuff and then you, you, we meet in the studio and then you discuss and some things, they on purpose, did too many things, you know? How did you meet Matt Moss? I listened to the music first for a long time before. And they found out about me because I think their CD didn't come out in that many copies. And I'd bought like quite a bit lump of them and given them out to all my mates. Cool. So, um, I guess I, I uh, after they did my remix, I probably hooked up with them in London. Yeah, I think that was the first time.
What about uh, Matthew Herbert, radio boy? How did you come across him? I've known him for longer. I think uh, I would just meet him a lot because he's obviously from England. I'm a lot at venues, like at gigs, clubs, and we would just kind of have similar um, opinions on, on music a lot of the time. So, yeah, I think maybe first time I met him in Spain, he came, there was a festival called Bene... I can't remember, Benissimo. No. Benissimo. Sounds, sounds Spanish. <laughs> Benissimo Festival, of course. Fantastic. I've been there loads that's of times. That's Italian. Oh, that's Italian. <laughs> uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I can't remember the name of that festival. Doesn't matter. We know. But um, he came there and um, he was playing the same night. And I think we partied pretty hard afterwards. Mark Bell, him, and uh, this Icelandic string octet. And, uh, and a flamenco guitarist who's a gypsy and his mates. So it was a big explosion when uh, the Icelandic classical kids were being introduced to some serious flamenco playing in a hotel room. So, yeah, that, that was quite dynamic.